Welcome to the Singapore Management University podcast series, where we feature the latest insights and perspectives from our faculty. This month, we talk to Assistant Professor Nafis Hanif from SMU's School of Social Sciences. Professor Nafis studies crime and behaviour. Her most recent research into Asian crime businesses has taken her to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, where she lived for four years. Thank you for speaking with us, Professor. Now, first off, tell us more about your extensive fieldwork in Kuala Lumpur. I understand that it has to do with media piracy. In Kuala Lumpur, I was researching the media piracy enterprise as organized by the syndicate. So basically, I was really attracted by two particular features of the syndicate uh, organized media piracy, which was its normalcy and its profitability. So what I did was I wanted to research the supply chain management of media counterfeits organized by the syndicate in order to understand how they achieve this normalcy and profitability. So I spent four years in KL, lived there, uh, and basically I did a lot of qualitative interviews as well as participant observation. I interviewed syndicate leaders uh, in order to understand how they organised the supply chain. The questions for them were, I was interested in finding out who they chose to corrupt in organising their supply chain and why they chose to corrupt particular uh, lawful actors in the process of organizing their supply chain. Uh, you know, the aim was to understand the function of corrupt actors in facilitating the business. Um, I also conducted a participant observation in syndicate-owned stores, in syndicate-owned media piracy stores throughout JB and KL. Um, basically, I wanted to observe how the workers interacted with consumers, how they marketed their products. And also, uh, by doing that, I got to interview the consumers as well. And I wanted to find out why consumers preferred syndicate-produced counterfeits as opposed to other legal and illegal options on the market. Did you manage to talk to some of these corrupt actors? And how did you get access to these syndicate leaders? Uh, The process of gaining access was actually a very arduous one. In fact, it took about one and a half years to gain access. And it was not easy. So in the beginning, you know, I also got into trouble with the syndicate and I left for a while and then to regroup, to re-strategize and then came back and basically I stalked the syndicate. And at some point there was some luck because uh, there were some friends uh, who actually knew or had encountered or had laundered money for the syndicate and then I touched base with these people in order to gain access. But it was a long period. It was over a period of one and a half years. Share with us how you managed to gain their trust in order to do your field research? So gaining trust um, of the syndicate leaders actually involved uh, uh, several things. In the beginning, the syndicate leaders actually had me followed in Malaysia as well as in Singapore. And I think that they wanted to see who I was interacting with, whether I was who I said I was, and whether I would be actually divulging any information to the police uh, or any other law enforcement agencies. So I think that was the primary reason why they had me followed. Um, Also, you know, there was the need to respect boundaries. So when the syndicate did not want to divulge any information, you know, I never pressured them. Uh, so I actually followed their pace. So in the first one and a half years, I actually did not have any access to the information that I wanted, such as how the business was actually organised. In fact, it was always small talk or coffee talk. And I had to endure that. It was only in the second year that I managed to slowly inch and get the information I wanted and I was allowed to conduct participant observation. And initially, participant observation was only allowed in very few small stores. But when I maintained the behaviour, I did not. In, I was not intrusive uh, in, in the process, in the business process. Then I was allowed to actually uh, conduct more participant observation across JB and KL, and in several of the bigger stores. So, what were the key findings of this interesting field research? So, there were several key findings. So one of it was that the organisation of the media piracy enterprise by the syndicate is largely motivated by entrepreneurial principles. Some of these entrepreneurial principles include taking risk with respect to developing new product, uh, exploring and opening up new markets, and introducing new marketing strategies. So the second is that criminal business organisation is very much geared towards swaying and normalising consumer demand for syndicate-produced media counterfeits specifically. 
Uh, the third would be the media piracy industry obeyed the laws of demand and supply just like any legitimate industry. And the fourth one was uh, violence is not the central modus operandi of criminal entrepreneurs. Violence, if and when it is employed, is done in a very calculated manner and in very specific circumstances. You've come up close with these crime leaders, yet you've said in another interview that the crime business is not as violent as many might assume it to be, and that crime leaders actually make rational decisions. Could you elaborate on that? A violent business is neither a profitable nor sustainable business. So violent businesses frighten away consumers and attract the attention of law enforcement agencies. By attracting the attention of law enforcement agencies, um, violence actually risks making the various stakeholders visible uh, and disrupt, you know, and potentially disrupt the corrupt collaborations that actually facilitate the business. So violence in that sense can also sacrifice the manpower that could otherwise be much more effectively or productively channeled. So in that sense, violence is always a final recourse in conflict resolution, never the first. Uh, and syndicate leaders only use it when they, you know, they lack any other options. Otherwise, syndicate leaders prefer to draw on their alliance with corrupt policing agents to eliminate illegal market competitors. Could you tell me how many of these leaders have you been in contact with? Uh, for the syndicate, the particular Malaysian-based syndicate that I'm studying, uh, there are three leaders uh, who are actually in the highest rung. So these are the three main leaders. And then there are also other district leaders. So in JB and in KL, where I conduct uh, field work, I also have to interact with these district leaders. Were they able to see the final report of your research? Yes, they were offered a final report. I'm not sure whether they read it. Uh, but he did ask for just a verbal summary of what I had written, and I gave him a verbal summary of what I had written. Were they happy with it? So the syndicate leaders felt that it was very accurate, that uh, there was no distortion of information, and I even showed them the quotes that, uh, or the excerpts that I used based on the interviews with them, and they were happy that uh, you know it was exactly how uh, they had said it. Your contributions to the dangerous field of criminology have gained recognition in Australia. You were awarded the National Council of Women of New South Wales Australia Day Awards in 2011. Could you share with us the work that you had done that caught the attention of people in Australia? I received the award for my doctorate research, which comparatively analysed uh, the organisation of the intellectual property piracy and human smuggling enterprise. Uh, I guess I merited the award for the dangerous research that I was doing as a female researcher in a men's world and for the notable aims of the project which was to understand criminal business and to develop policies to better police Asian crime business. Now has the element of danger ever deterred you from wanting to continue with your field research? Yes. But I think overall, it's, it's just made me very calculated and very careful when I am in the field. So it's made me strategize a lot of, you know, precautionary strategies to take and to observe while I'm in the field. What made you want to continue with this? The fact that, you know, it is necessary to prevent a crime business from doing the damage that it can do to the legitimate economy, to uh, society. So I think that's very important. For example, now that I'm studying human smuggling, you actually see vulnerable women and children are being exploited uh, in this smuggling trade. Human smuggling is transnational in nature. So it's, for example, the one that I'm studying now is between Philippines, Malaysia, and also between Thailand and Malaysia. So because these are where the women who are trafficked, these are their country of origin, either Philippines or Thailand, and how they are trafficked or smuggled into Malaysia and understanding how the crime is the crime business is organized will actually enable you to police better and to actually save lives from being exploited thank you very much prof nafis thank you